Salute e salve e benvenuti ad una nuova puntata di Storia d'Italia Extra. Eccoci alla prima di due puntate extra che voglio pubblicare nel giro di un paio di settimane, la prima in inglese, la seconda in italiano. In questo episodio, che vi pronuncio appunto è in inglese, parlo con Ben Jacobs di Wittenberg to Westphalia, un podcast che nelle sue intenzioni avrebbe dovuto coprire la storia dell'Europa moderna, che, attenzione, non vuol dire contemporanea. In sostanza l'Europa tra la riforma protestante e la fine della guerra dei trent'anni. Siccome però Ben è un tipo molto meticoloso, e in questo mi ricorda qualcuno, alla fine si è fatto risucchiare dal Medioevo, che aveva iniziato a narrare come preludio all'epoca moderna. Nel farlo e in diverse puntate ha coperto molti aspetti della storia medievale italiana e quindi abbiamo pensato che fosse interessante parlare assieme e trovare dei punti in comune tra i nostri due podcast. Ben si trova intorno all'epoca degli Ottoni e assieme abbiamo provato a riassumere la storia medievale italiana dalla caduta dell'impero romano all'epoca dei comuni, con un occhio in particolare all'evoluzione delle istituzioni, come per esempio il governo della città di Roma e anche e soprattutto all'economia. Buon ascolto e ci ritroviamo in coda per parlare invece della prossima puntata di Storia d'Italia Extra. to the call in the morning Greetings! My name is Benjamin Jacobs, your host as we travel towards Wittenberg and Westphalia, the wars of the Reformation. And I'm Marco Cappelli of Storia d'Italia, obviously. (laughs) This is episode 91, a chat with Marco. Over the last few episodes of Wittenberg to Westphalia, I've been covering the development of the city of Rome in the early Middle Ages, particularly in the 6th to 8th centuries. This is all serving as an introduction to the investiture controversy, but before we get to that, it turns out that one of my colleagues and friends from the History Podcasters Discord channel, Marco Capelli, has been working on this period as well, and is something of an expert, and uh, we thought it would be fun to have a chat about this period and maybe discuss a few of the outstanding topics that uh, the two of us thought would be fun to fun to chat about and fill it, flesh out the picture a bit. Also, it's just fun for the two of us to chat. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In reality, we were just uh, looking for an excuse to, to, to talk to each other about this, to- this period we are so passionate about. Now, this is normally where I would say you should all go listen to Marco's podcast, but there is a twist here. Uh, Marco <laughs> is the host of a show called Story d'Italia, and as the name implies, it's a history of Italy in Italian. Um, <laughs> so if you're a native speaker or you're interested or you're learning Italian because you know there's a lot of people that listen to my podcast they're not they don't speak Italian perfectly but they use it to learn history and Italian yeah, at the same time it's a great way to do it two for the price of one <laughs> and the price is still zero so anyways <laughs> yeah so uh, also you've uh, you've written a couple of books at this point yeah yeah I wrote a book about the crisis of the third century it's called per un pugno di barbari for a fistful of barbarians <laughs> so of course here there's the sergio leone not leone not leoni oh leoni oh, anyway <laughs> sergio leone reference of course um and then i wrote uh, il miglior nemico di roma the best enemy of rome like again trying to play a little bit your best friend or, or the worst enemy you are the best enemy the frenemy i shall say <laughs> probably in english uh of rome which is actually about the gods oh, okay. so the especially the visigoths cool and then you've got one in process right now about um the u.s civil war i believe yeah i did because uh, 
there's a there's a company called Storytel. It's basically competitor to Audible. I know it's not very common in the US, mm-hmm. and uh, and they commissioned uh, a podcast in in Italian again, mm-hmm. of course. And you know, I, and I had the freedom to choose a topic, so I thought, ah. U.S. Civil War is something that Italians don't know very well, and uh, I'm very passionate about uh, American history, oh, actually. Okay. So, so I said, okay, I can, I can uh, do something I love and get paid for it. So it's <laughs> it's always the best it's thing. Fantastic. <laughs> so you like American history, and you've done uh, late Roman Empire stuff. Um, what are your general areas of specialty? Yeah. So. In, in reality, the area that my podcast covers uh, starts with Constantine and goes ever forward. And I'm now at the time uh, in the seventh century. And in general, the my specialization has always been uh, uh, late antiquity. So that's the area I'm most passionate about. And then as I go forward, I got to get very excited about uh, the high middle age, you know, the early middle ages. So, uh, so that period of time until Charlemagne is, is, is really something that where I live in okay. right now. Yeah. Uh, and in general, I must say, I know Italian history more or less <laughs> every period, some period more, some period less, but uh the the italian history i know pretty well yeah i I definitely um you know obviously i started this project uh intending to talk about the early modern period and now i find myself something of an expert in medieval history so (laughs) indeed indeed it's fantastic you wanted to go in you know wittenberg to westphalia and of course i know that this is a running joke among your (laughs) listeners I know, but it's, I find it very fascinating. So I've been listening to your podcast Mm -hmm. and I find it your approach to, to, you know, I'll get there one day. Uh, But, you know, I'm on a road now. I feel like you are a bit like, you know, Bilbo uh, (laughs) that takes off from, from the Shire and says, it's dangerous to be on a road. You never know where it leads, you know, and it's it's dangerous to start a podcast. You never know (laughs) where the road leads you. And so, you know, I, I, when I started the podcast, I bought the book of, um, you know, Procopius, Mm -hmm. uh, all the wars of Procopius, which I wanted to, you know, I said, okay, I need to read this one first because I'm going to cover this Mm -hmm. soon. And then I covered it four years later. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can yeah. relate to that. <laughs> Absolutely. And, you know, the, the way I usually operate is that I, I sort of have questions in my mind that I don't have a good answer to. And so I, I sit down and start researching them. And then, you know, that ends up being the road. And <laughs> wherever it takes me, I record that. <laughs> And um, to look ahead for the listeners, the the big research question that I started out with, you know, when I sat down is, you know, all right, so there's all sorts of stuff to talk about with the the early modern period and everything and the Thirty Years' War. But when you sat down, when I sat down, it's like, okay, so we have at the end of the war, we've got the Holy Roman Empire, which is Catholic, fighting against the Protestants and the French, which are Catholic. And the Pope is sort of on the French side with the Protestants. So, what? Yeah, yeah. How, how, <laughs> how that happened? Exactly. How that happened? And so, right. The main, most of my show is about answering that question. <laughs> that question. How How is that possible? Indeed. And the roots are in this time yeah. period that you're covering because it's when the because actually the popes were a mostly religious role right at the beginning and for many centuries Mm -hmm. but then in the period that you have covered they become this temporal rule so now they have some of some competing needs yeah uh that that come from their pastoral role and their role as a head of state mm-hmm. uh, and sometimes they go ha- uh, hand in hand sometimes they don't <laughs> <laughs> and they certainly set up an international opposition with uh the the main powerhouses of Europe in in certain senses so and, and sometimes even for very petty reason oh, like absolutely. for example they organized a league against Venice <laughs> uh the league the league of Cambrai yes for Ravenna it was all about one city that 
that again f- because of this reason that we are st- learning now mm-hmm. no the why ravenna is so important if you look at it now it's such a small insignificant city mm-hmm. but it is the seat of empire right so venice wants to conquer ravenna no no us absolutely we will organize an alliance of all <laughs> europe against venice because of that you know it, it's it, it, it and you can't explain it yeah. unless you look back as you are doing and the, the war of the league of cambrai happened like right before <laughs> everything kicked off with martin luther and, and everything and um so it completely messes up the geopolitics and it led right into um this is where i haven't done my research in like four years because i've been focusing on the middle ages but uh well well you're gonna cover it in in, in 200 uh, episodes yeah. probably <laughs> so it's okay you can also cut it yeah or you can keep it and say that you cut yes. it you know like <laughs> like rob and jamie do yes <laughs> <laughs> So well, so speaking of research questions that uh, to drive conversation, I uh, I wrote down a couple for today that we can just sort of chat around, and uh, I think that's sort of the plan. So there's sort of two big questions that around this era that I haven't covered yet, and I'm probably not going to get to cover in any kind of detail. So I mm-hmm. figured we could uh, we could talk about this. So the first one is uh, whatever happens to the Senate. <laughs> Ah, yeah, that's uh, that's very interesting, right? So the so first of all, to answer that question is what is the Senate? So okay. what is the Senate in the late Roman Empire? The Senate in the late Roman Empire is is basically the seat of a class. It's a social class, mm-hmm. and it is the class of of the biggest um, uh, in, in a in a way the, the the largest landowners of the empire and there's two senates right one in the west and one in the east sure. like anything else so of course the senate in Rome is the OG uh, <laughs> uh, but but you, you know and the senate in Constantinople is always a little look, look, looked a bit down by the senators in Rome if you read the history books written a few decades ago they will tell you that the senate had lost all its powers. Um, Right now, the in the idea of uh, many historians is that they, they have reevaluated that because we see, especially in the late empire, as the role of emperor becomes more and more militarized, uh, the Senate actually regains powers. Hmm. Now, it, it's not a democratic institution of any sort. Right. They don't decide anything. <laughs> in the Senate, you do not uh, vote. For example, uh, you know when the when the people are you know the laws arrive, they they <laughs> upload the new laws. They they don't they don't vote, but it is an important center of power, mm-hmm. and this important center of power, uh, the the authorities of the later Roman Empire in the West, they need to negotiate with them because they have the pores. They they pay with their taxes the entire infrastructure. Sure, yeah. And and we can see that in Stilicho time, where he Stilicho, of course, one of the great generalissimo. That's an Italian word for it, by, by the <laughs> way. A late Roman Empire generalissimo goes there and negotiates. I'm doing this introduction to set it up. You know, I'll, I'll answer eventually. I promise. So he goes to to the Senate to ask uh, the authorization to negotiate with uh, Alaric, for example, mm-hmm. and pay Alaric. Uh, so that's kind of. Uh, the power and when actually the there's no more emperors in the west the senate is still there so and i think this you have already covered Mm -hmm. uh, under odoacer and theodoric uh, the first uh, uh, true kings of italy theodoric probably could be considered the very first king of italy sure the senate is a clear center of power in rome in ravenna you have uh, the government, mm-hmm. basically. <laughs> you have the prime minister. I, I tend to, to explain this. I tend to use this example. The emperor at this time is a bit like the president of the of, of the Republic or a king. Mm-hmm. Like uh, with formal powers and a, an important moral authority, an important symbol of the unity of the country. Mm-hmm. But the guy that is running the show is the prime minister, which is the king, King Theodoric. And he has his go- government. And then the Congress, the Parliament, is 
in Rome and they have a lot of power. So you think, where did they go? You know, and these senators, we know they have, we know many of their names. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, I give you an example in the Colosseum. Uh, at the time of the Wasser, they remade the Colosseum because it was still used for entertainment. They weren't doing the gladiatorial games anymore because those were forbidden, but they were doing other games, uh, also with beasts and other kind of games. And they remade the seats. And we have actually, because of course it's the last time it was renovated, right. we had names written <laughs> on the, you know, in the main uh, the main seat, like you will do today when you buy a box uh, at an opera theater. Right. No? <laughs> uh, so we know that, and we know them because they become consuls. Now, what are the consuls of the later Roman Empire? You have one consul for each half of the empire. Okay. And basically it's like a, a way of giving the maximum visibility for a powerful, important figure set of the senatorial class, almost always senatorial class, mm-hmm. and telling them you are really special for one year. <laughs> it's the maximum <laughs> honor, right? right? It's the maximum honor you can give short of becoming emperor. So, uh, so we know the names of all these big senatorial families. We even know a bit their income oh, because okay. uh, Olympiod- Olympiodorus author in the 5th century tells us uh, you know how much they made oh, okay. and, uh, be- and they were of course divided into different kind of levels he divides in three classes of senators right. and the amount that the top class of senators made is obscene right no we are talking about uh, jeff bezos levels <laughs> like uh, like ca- country size level of income right so in the West, they were extremely powerful. But then what happened? One quick question. At this point, were they did they have land holdings outside of mainland Italy? Or was it? Yes. Okay, okay. So that's... The most important area. Of course, you know, before the West started crumbling, they had it all over. Right. So there were families that we know their land ownings in Gaul, in the East, in Africa, in mm-hmm. Italy, wherever. Of course, Italy was important, but Africa was very important. Right, right. And so for them, it was a big blow when Carthage and right. North Africa went to the Vandals because that's where they had a lot of income coming from. Right. Not everything was taken away from them, but most was taken away from mm-hmm. them. So this class, they lost money because of, of course, all the barbarian invasions yeah. in, you know. As different parts of the empire went past, outside went, went of there. Past, but, but they never lost Italy. Right. So... Italy was always under their control. When the government changed, so it went from being a, formally a Roman emperor with a prime minister barbarian to having a Roman emperor not more, not anymore in the West, but in the East, and a prime minister still barbarian. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened, right? right. <laughs> not much changed in that sense. The, the country, Italy, was still under the same regime, and they had the same land ownings that they had. I mean, they had lost a lot, but they were still obscenely rich. Right. Uh, and we know, again, we know people, uh, very important senators that worked under uh, Odoacer, uh, famous Liberius, no? Liberius. Mm-hmm. Sorry if I, let's use the Latin uh, pronunciation, Liberius. So Liberius was a senator that worked as an administrator under Odoacer, then King Theodoric arrived, and he was the one that was at the head of the civil administration, basically the, the committee that had to assign land to the gods. Okay, yeah, sure. And and everybody praised him because he did a very good and fair job. He probably used mostly public land to settle the gods right. and kept the, the, the private senatorial <laughs> land. Uh, that's why they praised him, right? Right, right. <laughs> and Liberius, uh, Liberius then, you know what, what he did? When w- he worked for the successors of Theodoric. Right, right. And then, and then when we get to the point, at a certain point, he defects to Justinian <laughs> and he works for Justinian. Justinian sends him as the head of the military mission to conquer Spain. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> he, he's, he's administrator also of Egypt. So he becomes administrator of Egypt. Then Justinian sent him to Spain to, you know, Justinian reconquered a little piece of Spain in the south of Spain for a a time. Like Liberius was the head of that. He becomes also a Praetorian prefect in Gaul. 
and then finally he dies like 94 uh so uh, <laughs> so, so so you know the, the french says say about people like them reserve de la république like uh, somebody that could be used by the republic uh, to whatever mm -hmm. comes <laughs> you know we need to have a head of uh, some governmental office who will send this guy right. so that's and that's just one guy but we know many others so the, the the roman senate at this point even though like we've got justinian stomping through italy like a bull in a china shop uh yes <laughs> but very aptly put <laughs> um the the senate was still like the, the at least the high up people in the senate were still pretty well connected in the empire and oh yeah these guys they they had land ownings in the east they married with people in the east mm -hmm. all the time they traveled there you know you know the, all the time we have letter they exchanged the letters across the entire empire so they they were very interwoven into the fabric mm -hmm. of the empire and that was also the, a problem for theodoric because he he noticed right. that at a certain point yeah. uh, and the faction I don't know if everyone is is uh, knows the history of Boetius, Boet, Boetius. I, I know Boetius, but uh, maybe my I don't I don't think I went into him in much detail, so my listeners might not. Okay, so so maybe that's another like Liberius is another nice story, you know. Mm -hmm. And this is the same time we're yes. talking about the same contemporaries, and he's of course in the great family of the uh, Simaki, or which is one of those super high echelon families we have. Uh, Simacus, for example, uh, the original, uh, most famous member was a writer in the fourth century, and we have his letters across the entire empire. We know a lot about the senatorial class mm -hmm. thanks to his letters. And Boetius was an administrator, mm -hmm. bureaucrat, and philosopher. Right. So, of course, he's very the most. The, the reason why he's most famous is because he wrote one of the most popular pieces of philosophy in the middle ages it was yeah. right it was it was like the bestseller of the middle ages you know, the consolations of philosophy yeah. and uh, which is kind of it's an interesting the, the reason it survived is uh and became so popular it's kind of like a a textbook it, it he goes and touches on every all the greatest hits of ancient philosophy and has yeah. them all talking and, to each other in like a dialogue. So if you needed one book to teach your kids philosophy at your monastery yeah, school, it's a good it, it's it's a good summary and also it's a good read mm -hmm. because you know I read it and it's actually a fun read, a relatively fun read because because of the story. You know, let's right. say why it's so yeah, you know yeah. it's so notorious because Boetius. We don't know the details, right? But he got tangled in something probably not he wasn't let's say guilty of of treason but he got in let's say <laughs> enmeshed into probably a treason plot against the other we cannot say for sure what happened likely there was a faction because there was a problem of succession of theodoric the the yeah. the heir that was named had died uh, theodoric only had a daughter uh, and a very little grandson. So everybody started at that point started yeah. thinking, oh, what, what should we do? And it's possible that a faction in the Roman Senate, uh, with their connection to Constantinople, tried to to find, a, let's say, a solution to the Theoderic problem. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. So and it's possible that Boethius only tried to defend one of the person. Well, we know that he tried to defend one of the person accused, but of course. If you are the king and you look at that and you think, oh, so he must be, you know, yeah. uh, uh, working with them, but maybe, probably, he wasn't, right. and he was only defending a friend. So we we don't know. Of course, we will never know the the truth. But the point is, he is arrested and put in a jail in Pavia uh, in North Italy, Ticino at the time, and there in prison. He writes the consolation of philosophy, right. and he writes as the philosophy comes to visit him as a beautiful woman <laughs> and talks to her, and he tells he tells her, you know, why did I spend so much time with you, and now look where where I am, and then he asks very pugnant question like why people that are evil seem to thrive, and the people that are good instead are punished and suffer, you know, like. Yeah. questions that humanity has had since the dawn of time obviously right 
uh, but you know it's it's all pretty interesting so and this is another member of this class and again we are talking about the sixth century and you wouldn't really know that we are not in antiquity anymore that's why right. we call it late antiquity right because it, it doesn't feel different. Yeah. These, the constellations of philosophy could have been written in the 4th century mm -hmm. by a Christian author. It would have been the same. The conditions are not very different. It would have been persecuted by a Roman emperor, but it would, the, the class is still there. That social class of the senator is still there. The structure of the state is the same, at least in Italy. Right. Not in Gaul or Spain or... Uh, Vandal Africa, although you could make a case also there, but that very definitely in Italy, nothing major has changed. Right. So to answer your original question, when does that change? Right. right. Uh, and that's you referred to it with Justinian mm -hmm. waltzing <laughs> in uh, like an elephant in, in a China store, because th that's really when it changes. And the I think the in Italy we should really consider the. Um, the war, the Italian war, or the, you know the, the the Roman Gothic war in the sixth century, as the let's say the the border between antiquity and and the Middle Ages. Yeah. At least for Italy, for of course it's more important for Italy. Uh, the, you can make a case for the entire Mediterranean, but for Italy, very definitely, that's what changes everything. And um, during the during this war, Italy is completely destroyed by the war. Several decades of fighting, Rome is taken and retaken four times, each time with a sack. Right. Uh, Milan is raised to the ground. Several other cities suffer tremendously. Uh, there is famine. We know terrible famines all across Italy. And there is, of course, uh, um, uh, the plague, sure. which hits right in the middle of, of the war. Of course, a plague is always going to be a plague. But if you are also fighting and there's famine, and by the way, there's also a problem with the weather because we know that there were several eruptions of of large volcanoes that uh, that cover the sun, oh, wow. okay. causing multiple years of failures of agriculture. Right. Uh, then, then of course, this is a situation which is dramatic. What we know is that most of the people we can track move to Constantinople. Oh, and okay. So most of the people of the very high echelon of the Senate, I mean, many die. Right. A lot of them die. A lot of them die there. They get in the crossfire during the war. Right. The people that can escape to Constantinople. And many then we find their successors there. Right. So... So that's what happened to the senators. Either died or were uh, in Constantinople. But then the war ends. And in theory, you may think, okay, you know, simple. These people, they had... Uh, uh, so we know that during the war, all the slaves that were tending the fields, they all didn't care anymore about their owners or anything. They probably took... Uh, you know, ownership of whatever they, yeah. they didn't pay any taxes so, or they, or they you know, ran uh, or they ran or they were killed. So, you know, there was such a confusion. We know that from laws that Justinian made that was a huge confusion. And of course, we also have towards the end of the war, we have uh, Totila, the king, the new king of the Ostrogoths that actually passed laws to allow uh, slaves to take ownership of the mm. of the land and to to become free and if, you know at the beginning to if they fought with for for, yeah. for the for Italy for him for, for Totila right. that was a war be, between Italy and the East right it's yeah. not between the gods and, and the Byzantines so if they fought for Italy they will get their freedom and their land you know typical uh, uh, typical thing so so we know also all that we know that there was a huge confusion. So imagine what happens after decades of war. You know, nobody knows who owns everything anymore. Right. The, the records have been burned. But maybe you still know that you own that land. And the, the thing, the good thing for the senators was that Justinian, when the war was winding down, he passed this Pragmatica Sanctione, which basically said, whatever Totila did is illegal. He was a tyrant. Right. So 
that those laws are not valid. However, all the laws, even though Justinian said that the Visigot, the sorry, the Ostrogothic kings were illegal, he said whatever the, whatever Theoderic uh, and successors, the lawful successor, uh, decided, it's still valid. So if you were a senator and you received land by by a law passed yeah. by Theoderic, you still own that land. We're, That's we're, we're not going to roll no? back the legal system by two hundred years only. 50. <laughs> Not even 50 was like the last 15 years where sure, yeah, okay. But so but just to say we will bring everything to the beginning of the war. Okay. So everybody will get back what they had then. Sure. And so in theory, if that would have worked, maybe the senator class would have rebuilt itself. Mm-hmm. However, we do not see any returning senators. So they stay in Constantinople, right. the one we know. So Probably they sent their agents to get the uh, income, but they didn't bother because Italy was a wasteland. Right. By, by the time. What, whatever they knew, the life they knew was destroyed. Well, you know, the, the, the whole economic system had been so strongly based on slavery in Italy in late antiquity. You know, whatever. Granted, it was a different form of slavery. Yeah, it's more more than slavery. It was more like this slavery soft of yeah. the. Um, Almost that, a tenant that, farming system kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Tenant farming. But but yes, they, they also had still a lot of slaves. Not as many as during the Republican time. Right. Uh, but they still owned plenty. So what are you going to... How are you, you... You take control of your land via an agent, but all of your tenants are gone or you know, yeah. dead or they're calling themselves goths now or... <laughs> yeah, or they, they they went away. So, so you know, the income... Uh, I, I don't remember, but I think I, there was uh, like one proof they were saying that they, they were lucky if they would get 10% yeah. on, on one of what they were making before the war. So, of course, there's not income anymore. Rome has been destroyed. You know, all, the, all your friends, your pals that you went to the party with, mm-hmm. they are now in Constantinople. Why bother going <laughs> to Italy, no? Yeah. And then something even worse happened that basically convinced them never to return. <laughs> and that was the Lombard invasion, right. which happened just a few years after the end uh, of, of the Gothic War. And uh, the, Lombard, the Lombard invasion wasn't particularly destructive. Yeah. So I always say that Italy was destroyed by the Roman Empire. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the Lombards were a pretty loose group. It's it's almost like they just walked in. <laughs> yeah, they, they walked in in an Italy that was absolutely exhausted. Yeah. And and actually, especially in the north of Italy, fairly anti anti empire. Yeah. So they didn't encounter like a principled opposition yeah. in that sense the, the the eastern administrators from what i've read did not cover themselves in glory there was an awful you know in the mean while the war is happening and everyone's dying of diseases and everything is burning they're also uh affecting some uh some really exquisite levels of corruption <laughs> uh the, it, 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 the war was absolutely the the gothic war was an absolute mess yeah and like like you would exp- i think has a level of modernity into it. When I, yeah. when you read it and you read these, uh, uh, I, I mean, it reminds me also of the Thirty Years' War yes. in that sense, yeah, like yeah. a like a very destructive, but not to the level of you know medieval or uh, even some you know late medieval uh, wars where you know you just have some traveling armies making damage somewhere, yeah. but not everywhere yeah you have this level of modern level of destruction that is really granular to the to end yes the administrators to win the war they did whatever they deem necessary right. with the local population At the beginning they tried to to let's say to to present themselves as liberators mm-hmm. with certain success but very quickly the Ital- italians <laughs> became this uh, had a very strong disillusion with them yeah. very very quickly so so yes yes they didn't cover themselves in glory definitely so long story short then the senate the senate is still there mm-hmm. so um we know the last meeting of the senate that we do know uh, happened in 604, if I my memory uh, goes well. So as you notice, the invasion, the Lombard invasion, 
the, the Gothic War was in the middle of the 6th century, so 533 to 554. Right. Then the Lombard invasion is 568. We know that there was still the prefect of the city, uh, Prefectus Urbi, in, in Rome, which was usually a senator. Uh, we know that there must have been some have, must have been there still. Mm-hmm. And then we know that in 604, Gregory the Great called one meeting of the Senate uh, to uh, basically to discuss uh, the news coming from uh, from the East about uh, about new emperor focus. And uh, basically the images of the emperor and the empress were brought in and everybody uh, gave their blessing to the to the new emperors. Right. And, but this meeting... Uh, significantly was not held in the uh, House of the Senate in the Forum, which you can still visit, by the way. If you go to Rome, you still see (laughs) standing the House House of the Senate because it was turned into a church. Right. So it was turned into a church, and then during fascism, they destroyed Uh. the church around it. Uh, Yeah, well, (laughs) you know how they... Yeah. They they weren't very respectful. No. Uh, I could say so many things about how much damage fascism did to... to, But anyways, that's not the (laughs) point. And and so you can see this House of the Sanity, which is in the Forum, was built by Diocletian Mm -hmm. uh, to substitute the earlier version that had burned down. Right. So that's from the third century. But the meeting was not held there. It was held at the Lateran Palace. Mm. So very symbolic. Yeah. You, the Lateran Palace is the palace of the popes. Right. By the way, if you know a little bit of Rome, this is a very typical of late antiquity cities. The Lateran is, is not in the center. Yeah. If you look at the walls, the Lateran is right next to the, to the walls. And that's, be, that's very typical of big uh, bishop palaces in Italy and 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 cathedrals too. Interesting. Because the 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 center of the town, the original center of the town is where you had all the temples. Right. And usually the cathedral was built somewhere else. Hmm. Usually at the edge of town. And then during the early middle ages often what happens is that the city moves. So yeah. the, the cathedral becomes the center of the city but it was not in the center of the old city. Right. Now Rome is a very peculiar yeah. situation because it it's much bigger than anything else so rome was more a collection of villages inside yes. these enormous walls <laughs> uh but other cities i can give you an example there's a very nice city called brescia in north italy i suggest to visit because there's incredible ruins there and uh, the forum survives all it's the best forum you can see in italy. oh great and that's because the city moved. Right. <laughs> and the forum was covered by a landslide. So it's you basically see this temp this temple and, and the forum is is almost I mean as unskated as it can be after two thousand years. Under a, yeah. And and many other cities did the same. So anyway, they have this meeting at the Lateran, and this is the last time we hear hear uh, of the Senate. And also the Praetorian Prefect disappears. Hmm. Again, the two things are probably connected. Yeah, yeah. So that's probably the end of this of the original Senate. That doesn't mean that later on we don't have again a Senate. Yeah. And that rea- starts to reappear uh, at the end of seventh, at the seventh century and beginning of eighth. Right. But apparently, it is not formed anymore by the old senatorial class. Right. But this new class of mil- military leaders mm-hmm. that you talked about also in, the, in your podcast. So what happens is Italy basically militarizes during the late 6th century and early 7th because it's so fragmented. Yeah. They each piece that remain, remains in the empire has to become a self-sufficient military district. Right. And the people running the show, they are not anymore civilians that pay a military to defend them. Right. But they are uh, of officials themselves. And often by their names, it's hard to say, but their names, it looks like there's a big changeover. So that, uh, that they are people coming some come from the east 
Mm. So they arrive in Italy with the Byzantine armies. Right, right. And then they, you know, you served in Italy, you stay, you like it there, nice place. And then you say, oh, you know, I make a lot of money as an official. Yeah. Why don't I buy some land, which now is cheap because yeah. people have died <laughs> and nobody knows anything. So, so they start buying, and we know that some there are some deeds surviving. They start buying land. Like in Ravenna, we have actual deeds of the time. And they buy land. That's what we think happened. Yeah. So they buy land, and then they became big landowners. Of course, that's the the highway to become like a, an important person. I think all time in, in all time yeah. history is there a time when buying land doesn't make <laughs> you become uh, an important uh, big shot in in your town? I think, <laughs> I think it's still valid. Probably today you buy a big company yeah. is even better. Yeah. But but you know if if you have a lot of ranches around the Texan city, yeah. I guarantee you, <laughs> you 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 will still have an important seat at the theater. So, certainly, you know, uh, pre-industrial societies, land is like the uh, it's, it's the source the of wealth. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's how they they become then the leader. But some are probably also Italian themselves that become mm-hmm. that are in the army, and again they career rich yeah powerful sometimes you buy sometimes you know you have the pointy thing yeah. you know what you're gonna say <laughs> yeah who's gonna say no <laughs> yeah, but this i have uh, this piece of paper that says yeah. that uh, i've yeah, what, yeah, what piece of paper <laughs> <laughs> tell me again <laughs> so let me just summarize this a little, a little bit so we had before there were like the ultra wealthy. There were sort of like a couple different classes of senator, even. Yes, within the senator, you have different levels. But the, yeah. So the absurdly wealthy ones either got killed in the wars, or most of them probably left. Yeah. Uh, so the people who were left were the probably the less wealthy ones to begin with. Exactly. And then, then you had all the land that was essentially worthless. The land was worth, ah, and I didn't say, the Lombards, of course, took a big chunk right. of it, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. So when the Lombards yeah. arrived, whatever was left, you know, Rome at that point ended 50 kilometers away from the city. So yes. imagine, yeah. and even if you owned something in, in another right. part of Italy, you couldn't get there. So again, right. the people there said... Bye bye. <laughs> One of the things that's interesting is uh, that I hadn't thought of before we started we started this conversation. The church ended up with you know just huge tracts yes. of land, yes. which is you know Gregory the Great. Part of why he's the great is that he was the guy who organized the the Pope's land holdings and started just delivering shipments of food into, into Rome, Rome and just yeah. handing it out on yeah. street corners essentially. I didn't mention that, and I should, and I should have. That wasn't necessarily the focus of what we were talking about, but I think it's an interesting connection that for most of the Middle Ages, we talk about the, the church accumulating power through sort of these uh, religious gifts that are given by the nobility for various reasons. And we sort of, I'm used to thinking about it a certain way. It's like, you know, some wealthy widow who's dying and she writes out a, oh, yeah. a will, you yeah. know, and everything. I'm sort of thinking there's probably a different flavor to what's going on in this era, where it's just like some senator in Constantinople going... <laughs> It's worth Where can I dump this? Yeah, it, it, <laughs> I can correctly. And and they say, and here's one thing. Let's talk about monastery for one second, because this is <laughs> very interesting and it's valid across the entire Middle Ages, but it's definitely valid also in late antiquity. Right. You know, people think, oh, why a, a rich person would give away, let's say, a quarter of their wealth, no? That's right. that's a typical size, 20%, yeah. 25%. When they die, they will leave it and they will build a monastery on that land and, and gift the land right. to the monastery. And one can think like, oh, they really, they just cared about the afterlife. And they definitely, right. probably, yeah. many did. However, the monastery is also a place where, coincidentally, uh, Usually, the abbot or the abbess yeah. is of the same family. Yeah. This is also a way to set up, uh, you know, it's, my worthless nephew or something. But it's <laughs> even even another way. It's a way of locking wealth. Because yes. think of it as, as uh, you know, like uh, when they do the foundations now. No? The rich people, they create a, a foundation that for, for whatever, and they give that money there. 
and then the head of the board is a member of the family. Right. It's a, also a way to lock away wealth and make sure it's not touched anymore. Right. So if there is a risk, you where, what is safer? Is safer where is your wealth safer? It's safer with the church because if it's with the church, then typically a change of regime in order will will not touch that wealth. We'll try not to touch that wealth. Whereas a big landowner guy, change of regime, your land is the first one that goes to my supporters that brought right. me to the to, to the throne. If you bet right. on the wrong horse, uh, then you lose your land. But if it's locked away in a monastery, then you don't. So it's almost like a trust for like for the the members. You know, if I back the wrong horse, I'm probably dead anyway. But at least like the family will you know, be fine. My mother will they, be taken they will care still of, yeah. have influence. They will go. You know, yeah. and usually we see that the the son and the you know the we have uh, the same family ruling that the monastery for generations. So it's right. not something that is only the first one and then it's gone. That influence, that right. thing stays there. It's like yeah. So because the um. The, those positions, just to say this, they were elective positions like Abbot and everything like that. But once you, you know, once your family set up the institution and brought in all the monks. Yeah, yeah I mean, I put it here. I paid for everything. What you're going to do? You're going to vote against me? <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, <laughs> and, uh, so it's it's it, and I'm giving a big generalization here, but definitely there was also a lot of deeds at the deathbed to, you know, to make sure to do a last donation in order to right. appease, uh, you know, for whatever, for the afterlife, uh, so that people, many will build a church or a monastery so that people will pray in their right. name, right? So that, uh, mm -hmm. and there was the belief that if people in this world, these champions of God prayed in my name, then they will intercede for me in the afterlife. Of course, I'm not saying anything right. that is revolutionary. I just, uh, you have said it yeah. a million times. But, yeah. but but yes, the church accumulates an enormous amount of wealth. No, now the church, the churches, because- Right, yeah, that's important. We know, for example, that the two biggest landowner in Italy in the seventh century, in the late sixth and seventh, eighth century also, were uh, the church of Rome, the first one and the second mm -hmm. one was the church of Ravenna uh, right. was the second landowner and again and then they spent the next two centuries fighting <laughs> exactly and you, you again you see why I mean you see why and we even know yeah. how much it made for for example uh, uh, Agnellus um, the that is the basically writes the Liber Pontificalis of the ch uh, Ravenna church tells us sure. that in the 7th century now I go by memory. Eh? The, the Ravenna got uh, forty thousand modi of wheat a year, and um, fifty thousand um, gold coins, sure. which is, in case you wonder, it just translated into a lot. They got yeah. really a like, lot of money out of it. Most peasants would not see a gold coin in a year. <laughs> exactly. So it's and that's only from Sicily. Eh? That's the yeah. wealth. All, I mean, it was the most important land ownings outside the area of Ravenna that they had, but it mm -hmm. was not the only one. So, so, so that's kind of gives you an idea of of the importance of this. And we know from the the Epistolarium of Gregory that the church, unlike senators, they still had land ownings outside Italy. They had it in right. Africa. They had it in in Gaul, especially in Provence. Uh, yeah. So and they had a few. Yeah, they had Sardinia, Corsica, uh, Dalmatia, right. uh, and so and so forth. The one in Africa seems to be important. Also for the Church of Rome, by far the biggest was Sicily. Sicily was right. like the the thing that fed and gave money to all Italy during this time. Right, and you know everything. The, the transport routes were all chaotic and everything, but it was a little bit easier for the pope to come to you know every local lord and whatever and say like can we get some passage for our grain wagons yeah but <laughs> it wasn't grain wagons by the way all this was shipped by sea oh yeah that's true that's it was shipping. all shipped by sea all these la land ownings they were all connected by sea 
And in general, right, that's yeah. valid for all, almost, I will say the entire human history. It's always cheaper to, 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 to send yeah. stuff by, by sea. So actually, the, the thing about having the, la- the roads, in the past, they were saying, oh, the roads are all ruined, so that's why there's no... But, but really, not a lot of shipment went through roads. Most went... Right. You usually would get to the port nearest, really the closest thing you could get to whatever inland you needed to go, and then you yeah. you'll travel just a few miles on land. Yeah. And even in the north Italy, they will use the, the Po River and the rivers. Right for for sure. shipment and this is also in roman time eh? we're not talking yeah i, I mean because um one thing people don't think about it but you know pre pre-industrial technology your propulsive force for a wagon is actually if you're shipping grain they're eating the grain exactly so you, <laughs> you fairly quickly get to a point where your your cart is eating your horses and your oxen or whatever are eating more grain than they're the, actually the, 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 they're actually transport and, and that's why they, they used all these ingenious ways to move stuff around by water as much as possible maybe mm-hmm. your listeners will not know probably this but did you know that Ravenna was connected by canal to the Po River and itself from the Po River across the entire North Italy through Aquileia which is in the northeastern part all these by canals and waterways inside the lagoon even back then even back then we know wow. that because cassiodorus of course big uh, the the you know the one of the main important officials of the uh, of theoderic mm-hmm. wrote by the way a wonderful letter that i will suggest reading uh, i don't remember which book and which uh, but he wrote this letter to the to the uh, tribuni maritimi the uh, the maritime tribunes of Venezia, and so okay. this is considered this letter is considered like an like sort of birth letter of Venice. Of course, there's right. no Venice as we know today, but he describes their world and he says, "You across the water, uh, you never touch the sea, and you're able to move the goods al- along." Uh, uh, all basically all North Italy, you live in this world where you go by boat. Uh, the boat is your horse, and you <laughs> you tied your boat next to your house. Uh, it's very po- it's all very poetic and very detailed. So we know the mm-hmm. details and we know how the system worked, and we know from that that the system uh, was still working at the time. So it's uh it's in general water is what was used. But even in the Byzantine times, uh, we know that Naples, uh, Syracuse, um, uh, Carthage, uh, the right. port of Rome were all, Ravenna, they were all right. hubs of commerce. I will say one interesting thing that probably not many know. In Rome, there's an incredible excavation site called the Crypta Balbi. It's actually mm-hmm. uh, a museum, so you can visit today. Um, and cri- what is Cryptobalbi? Is basically imagine uh, one of these, uh, ins- you know, like like a-, a square with four streets around of ancient mm-hmm. Rome. That for a series of reason, basically in in the late 19th century they destroyed the buildings uh, of of you know medieval Renaissance time. The, you know, mm-hmm. again one of those things that you shouldn't do, but because they right. did, they left this hall in Rome <laughs> and then it was abandoned until the 80s of the 19th century of the 20th century sure. sorry so right. sure. and in the 80s luckily they started excavating it and it's the only excavation really at that level done in the center of Rome because normally in the center of Rome you can't excavate because you have all the buildings you can't destroy them to see what's behind uh, what's underneath and in Cryptobalbi they did and, they, and the interesting thing is by then, luckily, there was more attention to the medieval time. Because if they did the same during fascism, they would have destroyed all the medieval part. They say, ah, let's take yeah. away all this barbaric stuff. Let's get to the Romans. Uh, yeah. Often, by the way, you know, the, when you go to the forum now and you see the pavement of, of the forum, the, mm-hmm. the archaeologists of fascism destroyed the level of late antiquity because they thought there was medieval to get to the real Roman one. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and so uh. you see these monuments and you see the bottom, you, you can notice, you need notice the bottom is naked. 
but he's naked yeah. because the level uh, of the ancient time had reason and, yeah. and in late antiquity that looked nice but you know they basically got anyway yeah. enough uh, complaining <laughs> about did they complain already about fascism archaeology you mentioned it yeah. <laughs> okay so anyway in Krita Balbi luckily they did it in the 80s and they discovered this trove of proofs of trade mm -hmm. uh, in the 7th century 6th and 7th century in 6th 7th century Rome and this is extremely interesting because we have import from all over the Mediterranean Sea we do not have it from the 8th century right and and, and probably we'll get there no because the 8th century something changes quite dramatically but in the 7th mm -hmm. century in the 6th century we do have trade and we also have specialized they found in Cryptobalbi some specialized uh, manufacturing for Mm -hmm. uh, glass making for gold for you know to make um, jewelries and things they were clearly exported they found rings they were they were destined to uh, Lombard dukes gold rings right. so they had right. made them probably there was some defect so they threw them away <laughs> and or whatever <laughs> I, I don't know no they should have yeah. reused the gold so I don't know they found those and they and uh, they, they were clearly for export to Lombard Italy so we know that Rome in the 7th century, although much poorer, much smaller, was still right. inserted into the, let's say, network of, of trade sure. of the Mediterranean area. Now, if you think about the 7th century, you know that in, six, in the 630s, the Arabs arrive. But at the beginning, they only conquer uh, Egypt only. Egypt, Syria, and Palestine. Right. So they're still... All the trade that go to, goes to North Africa, that goes to the East. So that's mm -hmm. still there. Um, and finally, I don't know if you, maybe I shall add very briefly. Uh, no, go ahead. If you go to, you know, Piazza Venezia in Rome is the, the square in front, you know, where Mussolini did the, the speeches and where right, you have right. this big white uh, enormous monument you cannot possibly miss when you are in Rome right the, uh, it's the <laughs> wedding cake or the typewriter as they call it so that's if you've been to Rome you know what I'm talking about if you haven't when you go you'll see ah that's the typewriter <laughs> so <laughs> and and so the, in Piazza Venezia they have to build a metro stop uh, and so they did this all this archaeological excavation very recently in the uh 2010s and and okay. they found uh, uh this ancient uh, um uh, basically all made by Hadrian in the second century mm -hmm. but interestingly in the uh, seventh century in the sixth probably late sixth early seventh century was turned into uh, a coin making it's a mint sorry in, into a mint basically and uh, so we know that there was a mint there. And again, he was working, making gold coins and, uh, and, and bronze coins. But then it closed down in the early 8th century again. And that's another right. piece of the puzzle. No? <laughs> the trade <laughs> stops and the mint stops. The mint yeah. very clearly was run by the imperial government, not by the Pope. Mm -hmm. So... Ah, uh, okay, yeah, sure. So because we are still in the 7th century. In the 7th century, Rome, the Pope was very important. Gave food, the Lateran was basically a semi-government, as you explained. But it wasn't still in full control of the city. There were still right. officials of the empire uh, that, of course, probably worked also for the Pope, you know, the... the the, yeah. the border there is is hard to ascertain, but but there were the the, the mint was that mint clearly worth for the empire because when the popes right. start making their own coins, we know and they are very poor quality, and those are and <laughs> and those were not poor quality; those were imperial good quality coins. Right. Um, and and then we also know that the uh, Palatine Hill. Uh, you still had the imperial um, palace and there's a church if you go to the forum 
one of the, the Roman Forum, one of the sites you cannot visit with a normal ticket, but you need to buy a ticket with like added bonus. It's called Santa Maria Antiqua. And it's a very interesting church where you have uh, basically was covered again by a landslide in the ninth century after an earthquake. They built a church on top of it and people knew about it. So there was a decision made, but this time in modern times, okay, the church is, is like any other church. We can actually demolish it and, uh, mm -hmm. and get to the old church. And the old church has a fr trove of paintings and... Oh, uh, wow. from the 6th, 7th, 8th century. So it's really, wow. it's a magical place. Uh, if you want to see like very early medieval art in Rome, uh, that's the yeah. place. And um, yeah, and there they found again that, that probably this worked as a kind of imperial um, meeting place for, 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 the, uh, for the people working for the empire, for the Hellenic, Hellenophon, community in Rome because everything mm -hmm. is written in Greek that's another right. another very yeah. unusual if you think about it in the land of Latin <laughs> you have a church yeah. with things written in Greek and it's well, there's, a, there's a huge Greek population in Rome at yes. the time um, yes for a variety of reasons it wasn't just uh, imperial officials it yeah was it was traders people and people uh, of all sorts coming to rome yes and then once the persian wars and then immediately thereafter the arab invasions started happening out east then there were a lot of refugees yes and very true religious refugees uh coming in that, that kept things going uh, and then as I covered in the last couple of episodes, those people weren't always necessarily friendly to the Empire. <laughs> no, so. no, absolutely. Absolutely, it's true. Like the, the so-called Greek popes uh, from the yeah. late 7th and early 8th century as are very definitely on the, in the field, you know, uh, against whatever comes from the East uh, and they assert the autonomy of the, uh, of the papacy. So, no, no, absolutely. Uh, they are Hellenophon, but they are not... Uh, uh, stooge of the Empire. Yes. <laughs> if you if you're up for it, let's talk about the eighth century. Then, what was going on in Italy outside of Rome during the period we're covering? For the purposes of time and sanity, let's limit this to what was happening in Italy from like the arrival of the Lombards to the arrival of Otto the First. Ah, yes. V very <laughs> I'll try to be succinct <laughs> as you clearly noticed yeah. <laughs> I'm not very good at it but I will try no that's fine <laughs> uh, uh, but um, basically um, what we have is that we have after the invasion of, of the Lombards in 568 we have two Italys we, ha we had one Italy I usually get mad when people say that Italy is only 150 years old uh, 160 <laughs> a little bit more well, because after unification 1860, because Italy was really unified in the, I will say, after the social war in the first century before Christ. Uh, so we have un united Italy until the sixth century. But after, after 568, we have Lombard Italy and Imperial Italy or Byzantine Italy. And these are mm -hmm. very different. So Byzantine Italy, we have taxes like in the empire. Uh, we have uh, 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 the bishops that are the official of the city. Uh, we have an army organized uh, as, a, as a late Roman army, like again with uh, the officials and the people that are paid to do that, right? Even though they're starting to be paid much less and, and being much more landowners than anything, but that's an yeah. evolution. So we have that Italy looks a lot like the rest of the Byzantine Empire. Um, with, of course, variations. Uh, we have the very peculiar case of Rome, where the Pope, as the bishop of the city, has become so important in the city. Yeah. And then we have other areas where Ravenna is, we have the Exarch that has a much stronger authority on that area and is a direct appointee of the empire. So that area is much more connected to Constantinople than probably anywhere else. Sicily is a world on its own with its uh, heavy, like, like agriculture for export business, basically. 
uh, which yeah. is really very unique uh, in that sense. Uh, Lombard Italy is very different because in Lombard Italy, first of all, when the Lombards arrive, they expel or anyway limit a lot the power of bishops. The bishops that remain are for a long time, I mean, many cities, they lose the bishop. But the bishops that remain, right. they are clearly powerless for a long time. So it's a very different situation from Imperial Italy, where instead bishops are basically a sort of may, may, uh, mayors of the city, right? Right. And, uh, and then we have a situation where the army is not paid. The army right. is actually uh, formed by the freemen. The freemen have an obligation to fight. They don't. They're not paid to fight. Uh, they. It's very similar in a way to Republican Rome in that sense. That if you are a freeman, yeah. then you're supposed to fight for the country, um, and uh, and for the king in this case. Mm-hmm. Um, so so the situation there leads to a very much simpler administration because you you do not need to collect taxes anymore, basically. Uh, simply because you don't have to pay your, the army. The army, we know that was always the lion's share of the, um, of the expenditure uh, of the Roman state. So you don't have to collect taxes, and they, do, they don't. And mm-hmm. therefore, you don't need that big administration. You need a palace with lawyers uh, running the, um, the laws, you know, deciding, adjudicating law. Lo- you know, whatever, a tribunal, basically. And you need uh, officials in every city that are appointed by the king, uh, but are also important landowners of the area. And that's it. So that's kind of uh, the big division that we start to see between Lombard and Imperial Italy that continue to develop uh, for the entire 7th century. As the kingdom, kingdom of the Lombards becomes more and more sophisticated, because it... it it starts as a very, very rundown thing, but then with time consolidates a bit. The the, the authority of the king is grows in, in importance. Uh, when we get to the eighth century, Liuprand has clear control of the entire kingdom. And right. but it is a place where land is basically everything. Because you you don't make money anymore. Money is not right. important. What is important is land. You have land. The, you have uh, people uh, cultivating that land and giving you the extra and y- right. you live off the land and the power is not anything but land land is power uh, I mean land right. is power everywhere but it's much more because you, you can't have a lot of money you can only have a lot of right. land you cannot have a lot of money yes. and even officials the payment is assigning them land so telling them, okay, this land right. that belongs to the Gastald or the Duke um, will become, you are the Duke, so you take that land and you exploit right. it and that's your payment. That's Yeah, and in order to earn that land, you have a variety of official duties that you're supposed to perform. But... Exactly. But, and again, we're in early medieval state, so let's not exaggerate the complications of things, but in general... Uh, the Lombard Italy, you have a, a sort of administrator of the royal land, which is the Gastald. Mm-hmm. And then you have okay. uh, basically the Duke, uh, uh, that is the Dukes, that is basically the uh, starts as the head of the military district. So you are the Duke of Friuli. In right. theory, you are the commander of the regional army of Friuli, of that area of right. Italy. But then eventually, of course, that person maybe passed the dukedom to the son. Although, again, there's no yeah. feudal rules here. Huh? We, there's right. no, uh, because you are the duke of that town, then you, your son will be the duke of the town. That doesn't exist. They right. are considered as uh, appointed officials still uh, in the right. Roman mentality still. So we have these two uh, Italys that develop in parallel. And then in the 8th century, really simplifying, we have a third Italy that develops. And that that third Italy is what today we may call the Papal States. And it is basically the the Lombards in very important uh, passages, 751, when 
the Lombard King Astolf uh, conquers Ravenna. And then that's, you know, that's the... Again, Ravenna f- for the Pope is always so important. We, we talked about Cambrai, yeah. and it's the same here. Conquering Ravenna is like for the Pope it means, okay, I'm next. I don't want to become a Lombard bishop. Yeah. So what I will do, I will <laughs> travel to, fr- to, to, to Francia, to France, what we will call France, but it's not France, of course, Kingdom of the Franks. And uh, I yeah. will find an agreement with the Franks so that they will keep me alive. But this a situation in the 8th century develops because of the weakness of the Roman Empire that right. went through a very, very difficult phase and, and could not protect anymore central right. Italy from the Lombards. And it's worth saying the uh, maritime networks that we were t- just talking about a few minutes ago that were sort of the uh, heart and soul economically of the empire. Now we've got you know, yeah, Arab pirates now we have Arab, swarming Yeah, off. after the Battle of the Mast in 652, yeah. the Arab have a huge fleet, you know, they, yeah. <laughs> like Star Wars. They, they can... They can... <laughs> <laughs> they can sail now. <laughs> so <laughs> they are not in the desert anymore, <laughs> only in the desert. Yeah. <laughs> so you have that. Yes, and, and as I was saying about Cryptobalbi, we have a clear, big decline. They, when they take Carthage in 697 or 98, again, that's a huge blow to imperial, because Italy and North Africa are always connected and yeah. uh, have always been. And now that's severed. Mm. And that's another blow. Yeah. And then in the early 8th century, in the first half, you have the, a fight between the popes and the emperor regarding taxation, probably. They wrapped it into yeah. iconoclasm. So, yeah. <laughs> it was probably taxes. And, uh, um, and basically what the emperor did, uh, we don't know if Leo III or Constantine V, uh, the dung named, uh, but one of the two... <laughs> took away all the land. Here is the very important thing. Because the Pope rebelled and started not obeying the empire, the empire at a certain point, when they lost patience, said, okay, we are losing Rome. So what we are going to do, we are not going even to try to make up with them. And we are going to take away their source of power. What is their source of power? Their land in Sicily. So what we're going to do, we'll take it away. So they take away the land in Sicily and the rest of southern Italy where, where they have a stronger control of things. And they even take yeah. away those bishops from the authority of Rome. Right. And so and they put it under Constantinople. So basically saying, you're, you're out of here. But of course, that, right. that's already a break. And we're talking here the seven, 730s. So before actually uh, yeah. uh, the agreement with the Franks. Uh, so there was already a break. Very clearly, there was a break before yeah. the alliance with the Franks. There was a break, but then the Pope was left alone. A- and that's when we see the mint is closed. So there's no more mint. Yeah. They start minting their own crappy coins, the Popes. They, they don't but they don't <laughs> have any source of income. So they have to reorganize right. the land around Rome. They, they had never really cared about the land around Rome, which is not very fertile. It's not, it's not great right. land, but they do now have to care because that's what they have left. So they create these, um, uh, these uh, farms, uh, you know, mm-hmm. uh, the Domus Culte, which are these uh, farms that basically belong to the Pope and uh, they are organized to be at the same time source of income and source of fighters for the militia. So it's very clearly right. a state that is trying to be born uh, out of uh, the fight with the empire, but again, this uneasy relationship with the Lombards. And when the Lombards conquer Ravenna, the Pope thinks, "Okay, I broke with the po- with, with the empire, but I need some strong protector because otherwise I'll be conquered." And so that's where we have the alliance with with the Franks, uh, which at the beginning they come with Pepin. Uh, and yeah. they defeat the Lombards, but they don't conquer them. And then it will be Charlemagne that in 774 yeah. conquers the Lombards. I mean, I, I know you covered a, a bit this, but what is yeah. interesting behind, behind, besides the facts is what happens to Italy after the, the conquest yes. uh, uh, of the Franks. So what happens is that 
And again, this there is a big debate about this. Uh, many different opinions. So <laughs> take it. Uh, the Latins will say cum grano salis. So with <laughs> with a pinch of salt. Um, <laughs> the what we know is that the papal state go through an evolution where at the beginning they are probably a very autonomous part. Uh, they are probably allied with the Franks, but then when it morphs into an empire, they're kind of considered a very autonomous part within the empire. And what is this yeah. papal state, this third Italy? No, Because we have still three Italies. We have Sicily yeah. and the deep south. So, you know, the toe and the tip of the booth, right? Those areas right. and the bowl. Sicily is the bowl, usually. Uh, these areas yeah. are still imperial lands. They're under Constantinople. There's a lot of Greek spoken. Uh, the laws are the laws of the Roman Empire and everything is imperial Byzantine. Uh, then we have uh, uh, the, um, the papal states, which uh, really, if you think about them, to explain why they have that funny shape across Italy, yeah. it's, again, I know you like a lot of geography to explain history. <laughs> so, and that's because the main route to connect Ravenna and Rome uh, went right. through there, and is also the main route to go to the north. Today, if you want to go from Rome to Milan, you do not go through Ravenna; you stay on the uh, west side of Italy. But that right. was considered impractical at the time. So what they did, <laughs> they crossed Italy diagonally to Ravenna, and then they they went to Milan. Uh, so that's why yeah. that area developed into then the Papal State, and um, and then you have the Lombard Italy that has been conquered, um, where Charlemagne, over time, uh, changes all the main dukes into Frankish counts. So usually right. he waits that they die, and then he names a successor who will be a Frankish Frankish count. Notice the change right. of denomination. Lombards use dukes yeah. and the Franks use counts. Um, right. and, and then he starts passing laws, but he keeps the Lombard kingdom separated from the, his other kingdom. So the, the kingdom of Italy remains like a separate entity within the empire. Right. And this is considered at the beginning the, the first personal union in European history. Before it becomes an mm. empire, Basically, Charlemagne is at the same time king of the Franks and king of the Lombards. But then he becomes right. the empire. So right. we have that. No, we, yeah, we've, we've covered that, that part um, pretty well. The one thing to highlight, I think, is, um, you know, in terms of the show, basically from here on out for a while, whenever we talk about Italy, mostly we're talking about the kingdom of Italy, which is actually northern Italy. Yeah. Because Southern Italy is sort of doing its yeah. own thing, like you said, the, the three Italies. Okay, so from now on, let's talk only about the Kingdom of Italy, because yeah. you covered the Papal States anyway. And uh, yeah. what happens in the Kingdom of Italy is that uh, the first, uh, at the beginning, we have several, there's almost always a King of Italy. So there's always uh, a heir of, of the Emperor uh, in, during the, Car the Carolingian century, you know, the, the 9th century, there's almost always someone that is actually the king of Italy. Right. And, uh, and at the beginning, their authority is fairly strong. Like, it was strong, actually, at, towards the end, also the authority of the Lombard kings. Right. And right. that's because they had a lot of land. The kings actually owned a lot of land. And actually, the, the big landowners of Italy, they weren't that big at that time. So unlike right. in France, in, in Francia, where you had enormous landowners with a huge power, and they usually um, lived in the country, in their right. mansion, let's say, uh, in Italy, <laughs> the landowners, they tended to, first of all, have much smaller properties. And we know that from, you know, these deeds that start to appear from the 8th century afterwards. So we know that. And... And they, and they also tend to live in the city, so identify with the city. So they will be big, important f people inside their city life. So Italy right. has a city life that the rest of the Carolingian Empire doesn't have. I mean, there are, of course, yeah. cities in the Carolingian Empire, but they are very small things, and they're not important. The kings don't spend time right. in them, usually. 
Yeah. The the big lords don't spend time in them. They're just pe- places where people live, but they're not important. Right. In Italy, they are. And people identify their territory with the city. Right. Like they did in Roman time. This is there's much more continuity in that sense in, in Italy, mm-hmm. in the kingdom of Italy. And uh, and we start to see uh, an evolution where we even have, uh, for example, there's a famous uh, controversy which goes from Lombard time <laughs> to Carolingian time. You know, there's a fight in, in the courthouse between the city of Arezzo and the city of Siena in Tuscany. These are beautiful, <laughs> very beautiful cities, by the way. If you want to visit Italy, Arezzo and Siena, two th- you know, two thumbs up. Please go there. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, don't skip those small towns. And they are fighting uh, be- for the border of their bishopric. And uh, and the people of Siena clearly identify themselves as Senesi, even the, the important people. They're not counts of their own land. They are right. citizens of Siena. And the others are citizens of Arezzo. And, and, and we have several... And, and it's funny because we can... There's a paper trail of all this controversy yeah. w- that goes through the centuries, you know, uh, several Lombard kings, Charlemagne, and then successor of Charlemagne <laughs> could keep adjudicating this, hoping that it, they will stop fighting and they never do. You know, there, there's always uh, the Senesi saying, ah, this town should be mine. And the Arezzo, oh, no, these are belong to <laughs> us. Anyways, so we have this difference of of the Kingdom of Italy compared to the rest of the Carolingian world. It is more city-based and it is mm-hmm. um, the uh, the noblemen belong to the city and not the city to the noble. Right. Uh, right. And, but then the evolution that we start to see when the Carolingian disappear in the late 9th century is that we start seeing these big fights between uh, you know, the very factions, you know, the, you know, Spoletan faction, the faction for Berengar right. and the faction, all these <laughs> very nebulous fights. What they do is each faction tries to capture the kingdom. And by the way, often that brings the prize of the empire, because at that time, if you are king of Italy, often you are also emperor no? B- before Otto. But in order to do that, when they capture the throne, they need to give presents to their supporters. So what they do, they take right. these enormous land, own, uh, land holdings that the, the kingdom has, and they give pieces away. Right. And they give uh, the rights to build castles on it. A certain, mm-hmm. And of course, you, you know, this is famous. The, in Italian, it's called incastellamento. So when you, you have the... Right. Uh, the tra- because we do not have really castles until after the Carolingian time. So these people, right. that they get these gifts, then they build this castle with the authorization often of, from the king because you need their authorization to build the castle. Right. But then they have a nice wall to protect themselves. If, if the king yeah. ever <laughs> wants to take something back from them, says, come get me, you know? And yeah. we, we see several um, waves of gifts and gifts and gifts until probably... By, by the arrival of Otto the I to Italy, the power in a place where, where land is power, the power of the king was always his land ownings, not uh, the law, not the army. The, the power was right. owning all that land and all that land owning is really reduced. So therefore, the king of Italy is much reduced in power as a, as right. a title. It's just... It becomes very honorific at that point, and and then yeah. Well, and the um, having land gave you the law and gave you the army because the the military system was based on those free men being sort of called up to serve essentially, and also local lords got to exercise political power, especially once encastlementum got going. So the king, when they owned significant portions of the kingdom of Italy, they were able to call on large militaries by yeah. themselves because they owned the land where the free men exactly. lived. Exactly. They owned the land so that free right. men, you know, it didn't belong to them, but they looked at them. And so, right. of course, they controlled a large portion of the military force. And, and right. that's power, you know. And then you have all the income yeah. from that land that you could put to good use. 
uh, as well. Income, yeah. not in money, but you know, if you have lots of wheat, all olive oil right. and wine produced right. on that land, that has value. Eh? Uh, also, if it's not yeah. monetary value, you can exchange for whatever. You need weapons. Right. Uh, here's wine. Give me the weapons. I mean, I'm simplifying, but, uh, yeah, but that's about right. I mean, the the Franks were the ones who were producing the best swords. So you sent them a bunch of olive oil. And they <laughs> sent you a bunch of swords. In, exactly. So <laughs> land owning is power of the time, and it's very clear how yeah. the kings they were always trying to protect those small landowners from the. Um, from the power of the big landowners, because they knew that right. that that was also a source of power, you know, to uh, to to yeah. be able to present themselves as protector of the small ones. So the small ones, the small landowners, when they need to fight, they will they will answer the call of the king, but not the call of maybe the duke if he wants to rebel against the king. One of my favorite things from reading about. Uh... Berengar's rule. Oh, Who let's gets call a, it like a rule. lion share? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> <Yeah>. like... <laughs> he gets so much of the blame, maybe unfairly, but there's just so like the documents of him just giving away the right to collect tolls on specific individual bridges. Yeah. It's like this guy was <laughs> looking under the couch cushions for something to sell. <laughs> At certain point, they start even selling the gates. Yes, <laughs> they say. Uh, the city gate has a toll, so we'll give it to this family that will collect the toll. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's it's just a it's just a very strong privatization of the land. So, yeah, and this is a it's yeah. almost a yard sale of the government. A yard sale of <laughs> the government, and that's exactly it. And you know, I know that um, Wickham, Chris Wickham, is one of your favorite right. sources, and he has an incredibly good book. Uh, early, early medieval Italy. I will suggest this yes. one is a great book. Uh, Italian historians are very mad that they didn't make it them, themselves. <laughs> <laughs> They're very jealous. I, I read a lot of Italian historians and they say, ah, like Chris Wickham says, and they, you could say he's the only one that is not Italian that they quote <laughs> and say, ah, we really have to uh, <laughs> quote this damn <laughs> Englishman, but he wrote such a good book, we yeah. cannot <laughs> avoid it. So anyway, yeah, um, yeah and, and he says one important thing, because then in the 11th century, 12th century, sorry if I go a little bit ahead, but this will be relevant for the investiture crisis. The cities will reassert, the Italian cities will reassert their total control on the Italian land, which they had up until the 9th century. So the right. time for Italy, the time of the domination of lords is the narrowest in the Western world. Mm -hmm. The, the right. lords, the country lords, you know, that you could say in England, they're still the most important people. But, you know, <laughs> most European countries, they remain the most important political force at the very least until the, the modern uh, era, sometimes up, up until right. the French Revolution. In Italy, they are really important only between the 10th century and the 12th century, only two centuries. Because before mm -hmm. is all about cities, and after is all about cities, uh, and and right. and basically what will happen is that in those two centuries you have all this land that the king gave away, and they become basically fiefdom uh, that people right. keep, and you know the kings and emperors are not able to take away. Uh, but then what happens in the late 11th and early 12th century that in each city the population of the city wrestles away the control of the city from the bishop and they set up governments. These are the communes, the Italian communes. Right. And the first thing they do is they try to reassert then immediately the control of the city on all the surrounding landownings which they belong mm -hmm. to that city in antiquity. So usually, right. I will tell you this, Usually, an Italian province, so Italy is divided in about 100 provinces, right? Usually, an Italian province has the same borders of the communes or similar. And the right. communes have similar borders to the old Roman municipia. So there's a strong continuity. <laughs> and so what they, the communes, yeah. they do, they, you know, if you are from, I will say, Parma or Bologna or Florence, 
uh, they will go and they will go to the, this nobleman that got their deeds from Berengar <laughs> and they right. say what do you want to do? do you want to become uh, uh, a member of the city you know and sit in the council and you've been poor you know you, you can you can be and you have yeah. to build a house in the city of of Florence and be and be here or do you want us to make war wage war to you and take it <laughs> <laughs> yeah some some move uh, some move in the city some fight but over a few decades the cities will yeah. basically uh, reassert control on o- over the land of Italy and of course there's some merging going on there eh? the nobleman becomes yeah. then uh, important politicians in the in, right. in the life of of the communes yeah the people running the commune government are major landowners themselves in the surrounding yeah, areas big so. merchants too sometimes it's a more yeah. a bit more sophisticated uh, economy mm-hmm. at by that time so there's yeah. also merchants but by b- we start seeing bankers too yes uh, but yes. but yes land owning always helps like one of the big enemies of dante is farinata de uberti and he's a big right. landowner uh, around Florence. And remind me, are, are we talking before or after the First Crusade at this point? So the communes are af- mostly after. I think the f- after, very first right. ones they may be just slightly before. Okay. But we, we, yeah, you already had the city states in Italy before the communes. The most important one right. is Venice. So Venice. Right, uh, sometimes they say it's a commune, but it's really not. Uh, Communes, right. so the difference is this. Communes are heirs of Lombard Italy. Venice is a daughter okay. of empire. Venice sure. is the daughter yeah. of the Byzantine Empire, if anything. Uh, but right. And it was part of that other Italy, the Byzantine Italy, yeah. not Lombard Italy. The Lombard cities, I think I said this in the show at some point, I consider them just places where you store rich people. <laughs> like, that's the main <laughs> basis of their economy. <laughs> For a long time, it's and, true. For a long time, yeah. I mean, Lombard, Italy, I mean, first of all, we're talking about cities and probably medieval cities. We have an image of these uh, uh, rich medieval cities. The Lombard time, we're really not talking about that. There are cities that are recognizable because they have the walls, usually. They have the walls around and inside there's a, a gutted Roman city. <laughs> That's what, <laughs> what it is. But but it's still a city. And it's still a place where yeah. you have wealthy people. And it is true. However, yes. in late medieval time, that's not true anymore. Right. The economy gets going to a certain... And so that's sort of... Spoilers for everybody, but w- when you get to the communes, that sort of the uh, the power of the aristocracy as pure landowners is broken down as the economy diversifies, and you get bankers, and merchants, merchants that you, to... something you never saw before. You have these Medici. Mm-hmm. What what are they? Bankers <laughs> become popes. <laughs> <laughs> what what is that? <laughs> How's that possible? So and all that uh, starts really in the late uh, medieval time, and this really one yeah. of the best boom period of all time in pre-industrial. This is I really get frustrated when they say me- medieval. The Middle Ages is the Dark Ages. Yeah. So I imagine you do too. <laughs> it says like, one of the best time uh, f- uh, f- pre, of course, pre-industrial age. For, for world economy, and I'm talking world economy, because this is also compared sure. to China, compared to everywhere. Also, yeah. China has a really good time before the Mongols. But but right. this time, 1000 to uh, uh, 1343, to be, <laughs> uh, is yeah. really a, sure. like a boom town, a boom time. Yeah. And uh, uh, we see these cities that they lived comfortably and with a lot of space within the Roman walls. So the Roman walls... Mm-hmm. From, they were usually built in the late Roman Empire in the third century, and they their Italian cities lived comfortably within them with with space to spare until right. the year around the year one thousand, a little bit one thousand. And right. but then we see every city starts building a wall, and then another wall, and then another right. wall. And right. and if if you look at the size of Florence, 
in, in you know, the size of the walls of the 14th century compared to the one in the Roman time is like Florence is right. like a, a metropolis compared. And the funny thing is yeah. that Florence then will sit comfortably within those walls until the 19th century. <laughs> so, <laughs> because <laughs> yes. the population of Italian cities reaches a peak before the Black Death and then right. really doesn't change that much until the 19th century. So Milan, yeah. for example, was a huge city for the time. I had 150,000, probably maybe even 200,000 people in before the Black Death and will still yeah. have the same population in the 19th century. The same is true for Venice, another 200,000 yes. city uh, again. And we're talking 200,000 uh, people in the, yes. in, uh, again, uh, estimations, you can say 100, 200, you never know the exact, but it's a big city for the time mm -hmm. is a very large these are all very large cities for the time uh and but the roots are in the early medieval time because the italian cities never really uh declined as much as uh, above the alps they there was always yeah. something there to rebuild after from one interesting thesis that i've heard that is an explanation as to why sort of the transition started between landed aristocracy being stored in cities then going over to like actual service economy kind of situation is that the the aristocracy all went to the crusades and got killed <laughs> <laughs> well in the case of italian cities there were some italian cities that made an awful lot of money out of the crusaders actually yes so yeah. so the the that was yeah, the aristocracy of above the Alps went to fight and died oh, yeah. in the Holy Land. And the Italians, right. they got a lot of money out of paying. They, they had they needed ship, usually, for travel, yeah. uh, or they needed supplies. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, they needed financial services as well. Uh, so, and they mm -hmm. created them for them. And so, um, right. so Italy at the time... Uh, was a very different beast from yeah. from from the rest of Europe. The closest thing was Flanders, let's say. The right. the closest right. thing to Italy was Flanders, north of the Alps. But Italy at the time, it, there was a basis there. There was some yeah. Even before the boom, some trading always there, some connection to the Mediterranean Sea always there. At a small right. scale but always there. And then when the traffic started booming, for after in the boom time, that's where the wealth accumulated. And then, yes, they sold yeah. uh, all those services to the Crusaders. They got land out of the Crusades yeah. as well. They, that's they true. got yeah. emporium, even more important, they got emporium's rights, uh, trading rights in the Byzantine Empire, in the Arab world too. So yeah. they started accumulating yeah. that wealth. And then you have cities like Milan and Florence, which do not have the access to the sea, so you could say that for the marit so-called maritime republics. No? You have Genoa, Pisa, Amalfi, Venice, smaller ones like uh, Ancona, Gaeta, Bari. Those are cities that live off sea trade. But right. then you have inland towns like cities like uh, Florence and Milan, and they specialize in industry. And so they start... Right. Florence is the, you know, the source of wealth that then feeds into the banking sector is actually textiles. Right. And so they have right. this industry that they get going, uh, making textiles. And they, right. they make it so well that they can sell it uh, all over Europe. And they make an awful lot of money out of it. Milan makes weapons and a lot of other stuff. Also, Venice makes stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's not only trade. Yeah. But, so they start making stuff that Europe appreciates. They make money out of it. And then you have money, you can lend money. And then you, there you have a banker. Yeah. So, right. so, so actually the history of that, and then again, this is not the area of my specialization and I don't want to sugarcoat right. it, but I will say, yeah. because of course there must be also a lot of <laughs> exploitation yeah. going on. Oh, of we course, know yeah. of a strike, very famous strike of the uh, textile workers, Tumulto dei Ciompi in the yes. 14th century in Florence. They do a strike, mm -hmm. all the workers. So we even start seeing things that we connect to the industrial age happening 
in that time because yeah. we we see this this industrial sector in Italy that okay it's not industrial revolution level but it is definitely well beyond anything the Romans even had so it's kind of a yeah yeah that's that's a really good point they're, they're sort of hitting those pre or proto industrialization social organization features that you get in you know the rest of Europe over the next couple of centuries that uh, I'm going to be talking yeah, about. Yeah, no, eventually you do. I mean, because <laughs> the, 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 that Italy was advanced compared to the rest of Europe and yeah. richer too. Uh, at the time, was much richer and yes. advanced. That is not going to last, yeah. <laughs> but that's uh, that's uh, the situation, <laughs> and that fed, of course, all this bourgeois government uh, of the city communes, which yes, they had landowners, but they had also lots of merch and the border between the two are uh, they're fine in venice yeah, of course. in reality until they conquered the land empire which they did in the 15th century they really all the noblesmen yeah. were merchants so it's it's very very interesting venice has this this aristocracy of merchants and uh, it's really like the yeah. what you would imagine and uh, and Ve- venice venetian history is just so fascinating uh, it's so different from everything else in Italy. Also, it's 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 its yeah. own thing. It's really, it's really weird. weird. <laughs> they have this government, which is a constitutional government from I would say from the 13th to 18th century, using the same constitution in a sort of way of aristocratic uh, republic. There's no democratic at all. Yeah. Uh? <laughs> but. But they right. have the same form of government for a long time, and it's very different from the rest of Italy. And they don't care about the evolution of of, Itali- of Italy at the time. They just do always their own thing. Yeah. Uh, so, so, but that's yeah. another that story. So um, we've covered a lot of time, <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for doing this. This was a fun chat, and um, I think everybody learned a lot both in terms of the, the detailed stuff around the Senate and uh, sort of the nice spoilers <laughs> for what's coming. I think spoilers, everyone's going to have a... No, but first of all, thank you, Ben. <laughs> uh, I was really looking forward to talk to you. And I will say that I am amazed about the job you have done so far because I, oh. I, I don't... There's not stuff in Italian covering well things uh, how you did. Uh, and uh, and oh. also I would say Italians themselves don't know that part of their history. So 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 you so you, I, I say <laughs> okay. I will send some listeners your way because I think they can learn a lot of things. Oh, great. Well, thank you very much. And uh, hello to any of Marco's <laughs> listeners who have come over at this point by the time this is uh, published. And. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much. This was a, a lot of Likewise. fun. And um, we should probably wrap up before exactly. Zencaster kicks us off. Exactly. Ah, yeah, 12 minutes <laughs> still. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, man. I am made of stop with camel Sherman PT-17, 16 cloudy. Do you want to become an importer? Oh, hi. You have a yeah. visitor of the cat. <laughs> Duncan has joined us. Uh. <laughs> e questo, come dico sempre, è quanto. Vi consiglio assolutamente di ascoltare il podcast di Ben Jacobs, Wittenberg to Westphalia. Se invece volete ascoltare una puntata di Storia d'Italia Extra in italiano, ma sempre con un collega podcaster che produce un podcast in inglese, vi rimando alla prossima settimana. Intervisteremo Umberto Molinatti, un italianissimo ricercatore di fisica con il quale ho parlato di storia persiana. E non solo Sasanide. Umberto cura il podcast So You Think You Can Rule Persia? In una diretta abbiamo parlato di storia persiana dalle sue origini achemenidi, passando per i macedoni e finendo con Parti e Sasanidi. Non perdetevi l'altro lato della medaglia. E al prossimo lunedì per una nuova puntata di Storia d'Italia Extra.